Hello everyone and welcome to this afternoon's uh, afternoon lecture. Um, my name is Mark, I'm here at the National Botanic Gardens and today's lecture is Hidden in Plain Sight, Amazing Semi-Natural Grasslands with Dr. Maria Long here of the a Grassland Ecologist with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. So a few weeks ago we took a look at some signature species of Ireland's ancient woodlands with Dr. Rory Hodd. More recently we investigated the idea of rewilding land at all scales for native species with Dr. Paul Fitters of Chagask. But well, today we're going to look at some habitats kind of in between a wild woodland and a rewilding garden setting. These are the open habitats, the semi-natural grasslands um, that were once much more common in Ireland. So we call these semi-natural grasslands because Ireland, um, most of them have some sort of management such as grazing or cutting. Otherwise, most would in time be overtaken by woodland and scrub. But in other regards, they have a lot of natural uh, processes going on. They're not planted or ploughed or fed except by the sun or watered, but for the rain. And they're hosts their own incredible biodiversity above and below the soil. So these intricate habitats have for decades been threatened by improvement, intensification, and new threats are emerging like development and even the introduction of um, maybe species we don't, we don't that might not be too uh, beneficial to these habitats. And they, they need to be protected a lot, especially as they declined in recent years. We've already put a poll there, um, which might you might have a look and see um, how much these grasslands have declined in recent years. So obviously I'm not the expert in this to talk about it. Uh, Dr. Maria Long is the grassland ecologist with the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Her remit includes providing scientific advice on the conservation of grasslands, as well as oversight of survey, monitoring and management and designation for these habitats, because there's a number of different types of these grasslands. She also aims to raise public awareness of the value of semi-natural grasslands like we're doing today. Her PhD involved a study of the grassland scrub woodland continuum, um, and we'll talk a bit more about that, I'm sure, and the effects of abandonment on plant and mollusk communities. She worked for seven years as the BSBI uh, Irish officer here at the National Botanic Gardens, based here at the National Botanic Gardens, and has also worked independently as an ecological consultant between 2001 and 2019. So Maria is going to talk for about uh, 40, 45 minutes, and after that we'll have time for some questions. I see you've already got some questions there in the um, in in the feed. Um, the questions, bear in mind, mainly we're, we're talking about natural and semi-natural grasslands here. So if you have any horticultural questions, the best thing to do is probably email us at botanicgardens at opw.ie. Melissa is there in the chat if you have any uh, queries throughout the, the chat. And of course, you can just use the chat to chat along and enjoy the talk as well. So I'm going to uh, bow out now. I'm going to let Maria uh, take over and um, enjoy the talk and uh, talk to you at the end. OK, hello, everybody. So thanks a million. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, as Mark said, I work for NPWS, the National Parks and Wildlife Service. And I'm the grassland ecologist and I started in that role in May 2019. So I'm absolutely delighted to get the chance to share some information with you about our amazing semi-natural grasslands. So hopefully, Mark, you can let me know if uh, if this isn't working. We should be on my second slide now. Uh, absolutely, plan... it's working fine. Great stuff, great stuff. So the plan for today, we're going to touch on a number of different topics. So I'm going to look at what are semi-natural grasslands and why are they important? I'm going to ask the question, why might they sometimes be invisible? Um, what types do we have? Where are they found? And how might you recognise them? I'm going to touch on um, the issue of what might be threatening them. And I'm going to uh, a little bit of focus on nutrients and nutrient enrichment. Uh, a little bit of chat because it's quite topical at the moment. Um, uh, we're going to talk about wildflower meadows in inverted commas and wildflower seeds. I'm going to give you some take home messages to wrap it all up. And at the very end, it provides some information sources, so web links and, and, and um, places you can go to find out more if this is something that interests you. And that, that information will be there uh, afterwards on the recording of the talk if, for anybody that wants to do some homework. So to start off with, I always start really with terminology. So it feels a little bit like a school lesson, but bear with me, because I think it's important that we're all on the same wavelength and that everybody understands what's meant when you say a semi-natural grassland. Mark touched on it there in the intro. So the reason, there's a reason that we don't say natural grasslands. Natural grasslands occur elsewhere in the world. They typically occur in large areas where it's too dry or maybe too cold to sustain tree cover. There might, of, uh, there might often be uh, large populations of herbivores as well. These areas tend to be relatively little altered by man. So these are what we call natural grasslands. And Ireland is outside, it's, it's uh, separate from these areas in the world. Think of the, the prairies of North America, savannas of Africa. So we actually do have a, a climate that's very conducive to growing trees. So all of the grasslands we have in Ireland are either semi-natural or improved. So today the focus is going to be on the semi-natural grasslands, but improved grasslands, and again, inverted commas, these are agriculturally improved. So they're usually approved for, for agricultural purposes or perhaps actually amenity. So your lawn may be an improved grassland. 
And these are highly modified grasslands. So they're quite different uh, from, from semi-natural or natu natural grasslands in terms of intensity of management. And just a couple of more terms again, so that we see where things sit and how things relate to each other. You'll often see the term species rich and you might think, God, well, how does a species rich grassland compare to a semi-natural grassland? And what makes something species rich? If I walk into a grassland and count 10 species or 20 or 30, what makes it species rich? Well, there, I, I can't give you a, a simple number. It's very context dependent. It depends on the type of grassland. It depends on the soil, the size, all sorts of different things. But a species rich grassland will always have a variety of species that won't be dominated by one or a few. And it won't be the standard few. I'll mention some of the, the standard few in agricultural settings in a minute. Um, and species rich grasslands are almost always semi-natural. So what's a multi-species sward and how does that relate to, to species richness? So a multi-species sward is quite, uh, becoming quite a common term now, but it's an agricultural term. And it, it applies to the practice of adding a handful of extra species into an agricultural sward. Um, it can bring big benefits uh, to really productive settings, but it isn't a species rich or a semi-natural grassland. So just to have that, that, that difference in your head. And another agricultural kind of overlap term is HNV, high nature value farmland. So this is farmland that's managed in a low intensity way. Uh, often the grasslands are semi-natural and typically this type of landscape or this kind of farmland is good for nature and typically fairly rich in biodiversity. So it's all to do with the intensity of management and more on that now in a second. So hopefully that helps us uh, get some of the settings. I'll mostly be talking about semi-natural grasslands and sometimes I'll talk about species rich grasslands as well. So let's look a little bit more at the, 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 the either ends of the spectrum from improved grasslands to semi-natural grasslands. And it really does relate, as I mentioned, to the intensity of the management. So intensive agriculture will involve some or all of the following. And I've got a, a photograph there showing a typical scene from an intensive agricultural setting. This, uh, this field here in the photograph will have been ploughed and reseeded. There will be fertilizer applied. Uh, will have high stocking rates, perhaps at certain times of the year. There'll probably be some chemical application, herbicide, pesticide, fungicide, maybe. And there may be some field boundary removal so the machinery can move around easily, more easily. It's all about economies of scale when you're at this intensive agricultural production. Depending on the existing soil conditions and soil pH, there might be lime application, there might be drainage if parts of the fields are wet. So all of these actions together um, and when they're all used at a, at a high intensity uh, conform to intensive agriculture. And if we look at the other end of the spectrum, and of course it is a spectrum, grasslands, farms, farmers exist all along this spectrum. But if we go to the other end, uh, extensive farming is typified by usually no ploughing, uh, usually little or no reseeding, sometimes a little hand broadcast of seed, depending, little or no fertilization, low stocking densities, low or no chemical use. So you start to see the, 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 the difference here. And I'll mention that photograph now at the bottom right shows a very species rich grassland. So that is far at the opposite end of the spectrum. Many fields, many farms, many grasslands sit at various points along the spectrum. But it is interesting to think about the impact of management on the habitat and the species that are present. So for a lot of our semi-natural grasslands, for all of them, in fact, they're pretty low nutrient habitats, but they do need ongoing management. So that's the key thing. It's not a case of uh, walk away and stop managing. Absolutely not. So does this matter? Uh, what, what, what are the, the, the differences and the implications for nature and biodiversity in, in terms of where, where a field or a grassland might sit on that spectrum? And yes, it absolutely matters. In a typical improved field that might be used for, for silage or dairy, there's only gonna be one or a few species dominating in that field. Very often, uh, perennial ryegrass. Uh, it's probably the most common plant in Ireland. So this is the, the main grass that's reseeded into um, intensive agricultural fields. There might be a handful of other species, they usually are, but these will be species that cope well in a high nutrient environment. So docks, thistles, nettles, white clover. So these are the usual suspects. Uh, they cope well in highly competitive, high nutrient situations, but it's a small handful of species. So production will be high in these areas, but other services such as biodiversity will be low, as you can imagine. So in a semi-natural grassland, you're gonna have much higher diversity of species, uh, of vegetation structure. So the shape and size and height and clumping of the vegetation will be different because there are different plants. They all, they all have a slightly different makeup. The soil will be uh, more diverse. There'll be more uh, diversity uh, of soil animals, of rooting depth, all sorts of different things. 
And rather than just having one or a small number of species dominating and just a handful of good competitors, you'll have quite high species diversity. You can have very, very high. You can have over 40 species of vascular plant in a two by two meter area, no problem, in a nice area of semi-natural grassland. Again, I'm talking about two ends of a spectrum here. It's a lot, a lot of in between. Also in the semi-natural grasslands, you've got much higher resilience due to the higher diversity. And what we mean there is, for example, with climate change, if we're going to have more droughts, you've got species with different rooting depths um, so that there'll be more ability for the, for the grassland to stay healthy due to the variety of different plants that live there. And there's a raft of other benefits and services, some of which I'll men mention shortly. Um, and if we, well, indeed, we are moving from a situation where we have mostly semi-natural grasslands, as we would have had in the past, to having mostly improved grasslands, what are the knock-on effects? So I'm just going to mention a couple of studies from the UK because they... They illustrate quite well some of the knock on effects that we're seeing in terms of plant species. We don't have exactly similar data, but it is a very similar picture in Ireland. So one of the first things to mention, they've measured in the UK and 97 percent of meadows have been lost since the 1930s in the UK. So in one way, perhaps it's not surprising. Uh, in the 1930s, hay meadows would have been the main way of farming. They would have been the main way of collecting feed for your animals for the winter. And that's just not the case now. But it is quite shocking that really we haven't managed to support the retention of a higher proportion. I don't have a figure for Ireland, but it is going to be very similar. It's going to be of a very similar scale to that. In terms of individual grassland plant species, in the last 60 years in the UK, 10 grasslands, grassland plant species have gone completely extinct, which itself is a tragedy, but it hides the real extent of the losses in actual fact. If you look on a county by county basis, and a county is still quite a large area, Species are being lost, so going extinct on a county by county basis at the rate of about one species per county per year. And the rate of loss is accelerating. So the, the, the report that, that's shown there on the slide, that, that report is quite interesting and quite shocking. And it does show us the, the effects of these changes in how we manage the land and how that has a knock on effect to our natural species. So back to Ireland and a move to, the, to, to have a look at some Irish species. So I'm going to look at some bird species and I'm going to start with an example. You, I, I, you can nearly guess what I'm going to start with, the story of the corncrake. This bird was absolutely ubiquitous to the point that it was a pest in Ireland. People used to say the corncrake's keeping me awake at night. And corncrake numbers fell off a cliff between the 70s and the 90s to the point that we barely have 100 pairs left in the country. And this is simply to do with changes in agriculture, how we manage land and the loss of meadow making. So in case you're interested, there's a new project, Corncrake Life, I encourage you to have a look, just set up this year, looking to work to support farmers in areas where corncrake are still present. So we are still trying to support the corncrake. We don't want to see the loss of this species from the country. What about other farmland birds? The corn bunting is now lost from Ireland. Twice, population decline of about 98%. Breeding curlew and lapwing, down at least 90%. Quinchat, 77% decline in the breeding range. Uh, Yellowhammer, uh, significant contraction in the breeding range. So there's a number of farmland birds uh, that are that are being lost and threatened and, and that are going into decline because of how of changes in our land management. And look, we can't stop all progress, but can could, could we support some farmers to farm differently to change this story a little? Um, I like this graphic because I think it illustrates quite well uh, what happens. I'm going to start, and unfortunately, I don't know the source of this. If anybody does, you can you can put it in the chat, please. So I'm going to start at the top left hand corner and you see a landscape there illustrated with lots of different small fields, lots of different land uses. We can picture that there are different crops, there are field boundaries, patches of scrub, some big trees, and there's a wiggly little stream in the valley bottom. And depicted just to the right of that is a little matrix showing all the different plants and animals and critters, large and small, that can be supported in a landscape such as this. So there's room for large animals to hunt smaller animals. There's shelter, there's a place for breeding, for displaying, for calling. There's water and wet habitats for the invertebrate creatures. So let's move down to the middle row. So if you look at the left-hand side, you can see there's some simplification of the landscape happening. The fields are larger, there are fewer field boundaries. There's less woody cover, there's less diversity of crops. So you can see the matrix just to the right of it now has fewer animal species. So there's less space for nature in this landscape just by simplifying to, to that moderate degree. And let's look at the bottom row. This is how an awful lot of landscapes look, particularly when you go to Europe, or parts of Ireland too. Hugely simplified landscapes, field boundaries removed, rivers and streams canalized, 
almost no space for nature. A very small number of creatures can survive in habitats like this. And just to give a, a little visual, a real world visualization, these are images that I picked at relatively at random. Uh, the bottom one is from Wexford and the top one is from Leitrim. So let's look at Wexford. Wexford is not a huge far cry from the, the bottom left um, image in, in, uh, in the graphic. And there are large fields, there are very few field boundaries, there are very little features like ponds and woodlands and scrub. Now, we need places like Wexford to produce our food. This is, this is a reality. But the challenge is, can we make these landscapes a little bit more friendly for nature, a little bit more uh, space for nature? Could we have more complete field boundaries? Could we have small little copses or groves of trees? Could we have a, a network of ponds? The upper image as well, um, let's have a look at that. A network of small fields, wide hedges. In fact, if you look at the middle area of that photograph, um, I think that farm is abandoned. So just below the house and to the, to the left of the road, I think that's abandoned. So there's a bit of rewilding going on and you might say, great. But what I also see there is a, a, an area of land where we might lose some of the open species. That Those might be very species rich grasslands. We might be losing some open species. But much more than that, I see the risk of forestry. So what we want is we want to be able to support farmers to keep farming on these small areas of land rather than seeing broad scale abandonment. I'll mention it later, but it is one of the big risks that we have to our semi-natural grasslands. So in both of these landscapes, we have challenges in terms of supporting the land use. So I'm just going to itemize a couple, not an exhaustive list at all, of the eco ecosystem services that are performed by semi-natural grasslands in our landscapes. So of course they provide food, provide food for domestic stock. And I would argue that a field that has 20, 40, 60 different species of plant across the field makes for a much better and more varied diet for our domestic stock than a, a field with just one or two. Um, so they make very good quality food, even if the quantities aren't as vast as a, as a, a highly productive and highly managed field. But also, of course, they provide food for a wide range of our wild animals, including pollinators and shelter also for a wide range of invertebrates and for small mammals and ground nesting birds. As we saw, the, the, the changes and the loss in semi-natural grasslands is driving decreases in a large number of our ground nesting and farmland birds. Uh, grasslands are important for carbon sequestration and storage, uh, semi-natural grasslands. And this is something that often comes as a surprise to people. The, there's an oversimplified view that woodlands are where it's at and woodlands and forestry. I'm gonna show, show something in the next slide to, to touch on that. Um, I mentioned already water regulation. If you've got a range of different plant species with a range of different rooting depths and growth forms, you have a better capacity to regulate water, both in terms of storage, but also in terms of, of quality. So you've got better water when the water moves off the landscape that it's cleaner, it's, it's more filtered. And uh, on a similar vein, if you've got a healthy natural vegetation sward, it holds soil in place. So you don't have soil washing off if there is, for example, heavy rain. And again, climate change is going to bring heavier, more dramatic rainfall events. Semi-natural grasslands are also fantastic reservoirs of wild species diversity and, and also sources of genetic variation. They're a key part of our agricultural and rural heritage also. And in Ireland, that is hugely important, notwithstanding that many of us now live in cities, we, cities, we still have a, a really strong connection to, to the rural part of our heritage. It is part of what defines us and it's part of what we sell to other people, this uh, 40 shades of green. So there's a very strong connection of sense of place um, linked with management of grasslands. And there's a great sense of well-being and enjoyment. It is definitely without question more enjoyable to be in a, a species rich meadow rather than being in an intensive dairy pasture. I can tell you, and people might not often think about why that is or what it is, but there's definitely an, uh, uh, there's definitely a, a difference to the experience to be had. So just very quickly, two things I want to show you from some very interesting work that's coming out from people associated with the, the Fl Floodplain Meadows Partnership in the UK. So this graphic here shows what's happening kind of above and below the ground in common wild species that occur in floodplain grasslands. And if you just look at the root, I know you, you, you're not going to be able to, to read the text probably. If you look at the deepest roots, they're from common knapweed or blackheads, some people call it. So common knapweed, Centauria nigra, they're over two meters deep at times. So if we have a range of native species that are growing with a, a range of different rooting depths and rooting strategies, we really it, it's a really nice visual to be able to see the, the way that this can help uh, in terms of carbon sequestration, bringing the carbon and locking it deep down in the soil with water management, with soil stability, range of different factors. 
And also the other thing I'm just going to quickly going to mention again, coming from a, a similar group of people working on floodplain meadows. So I clipped this from um, a talk that was given recently by David Gowing, one of the authors. This is unpublished yet, but hopefully they'll have it out at the end of the year. And this table shows us the mean carbon density in soils under a range of different habitat types. And if you look at neutral grassland, it's actually not that much below the, the amount of carbon that's stored in the soil under a broadleaf woodland. So that in itself is quite surprising, but what's going to be remarkable, and I can't wait for this to be published to see the, the detail of the data, species rich floodplain meadows may store vastly more carbon in their soil surface the, uh, than broadleaf woodlands. So we may yet be rethinking uh, just how important and what types of habitats are, are good at storing carbon. So, um, Let's have a quick look at why my grasslands be invisible. I said they're hidden in plain sight. Well, I think one of the reasons the grasslands are invisible is for some people, for a lot of people, the, the two images here, it's just green. It's, it's just the background matrix. And Ireland is so agricultural where our main habitat is fields. A lot of people just don't see a difference or, or if they do, what they see in the picture on the right hand side is maybe waste ground if, if they do differentiate a difference or, or, or weeds. And so very often it's simply a lack of awareness. So if I was to ask a member of the public to uh, go find me a woodland or maybe scan some aerial imagery for woodlands, they wouldn't struggle because everybody understands what a woodland looks like. And um, they're very obvious. Their, their value is intrinsically understood by people, but it's not the same for grasslands. The, the different types of grasslands and the, 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 the differences are, are more subtle, but not if you think about it. So after today's talk, there won't be any uh, any such um, misconceptions in this audience. And look, just very quickly brought this up again, zoomed in on both of those swords. I think we can very clearly understand the difference in complexity and structure that a, a species rich sward brings rather than one that's dominated by just one species. Which one has more space for more critters? Okay, another way that grasslands can be invisible is, like I mentioned, if somebody is, for whatever reason, this, this is the River Moy in, in County Mayo, for whatever reason, I, I tasked somebody with uh, saying, scan the aerial photographs and find me all the patches of woodland. It, it, it would be a relatively easy task. There would be lots of different types of woodlands, but the woodlands would be identifiable. If I said, can you find me all the patches of species rich grassland or semi-natural grassland, that would be a different task entirely. So in this photograph, there are some very nice grasslands. And in fact, in this photograph is one of the nicest uh, lowland hay meadows that I've ever been in. It's a very, very species rich, beautiful habitat. And if I asked you, where might it be? So your eyes going to scan this photograph and probably most people are looking at the top left, maybe the top middle, where you can see maybe some water patterns, some um, lumpy bumpy bits, some different colors. And you're not wrong. A lot of there's a lot of nice grasslands, but actually the nicest grasslands that I've been in for, for, uh, across this suite is inside the red circle there. And it looks quite uniform. Very hard to tell that grassland from some of its neighbors, which are actually improved grasslands in this in this image. So they can be quite invisible in that way as well. So this is a photograph close up from from within that circle. So very uh, for, for years, this has been managed traditionally as a hay meadow. So very species rich, full of herbs herbaceous plants. And another way also that, that these can be kind of invisible, this photo is from the same field, just a different part. The farmer had been in and cut part of the field uh, the day I was there. So if, if a meadow has just been mown, um, its characteristics are very hard to tell. Its species makeup, you can tell a bit, but once you also get that green flush, once things start to regrow, that green flush is quite uniform looking because everything's the same height. It's got this fresh green color. So again, a little bit hidden. Okie dokie. Uh, let's have a look at what types of semi-natural grasslands we have in Ireland. So there's going to be a bit of detail here, so you can let this wash over you if the detail is not important. Otherwise, um, come with me as, as we look at this. Um, so we're very lucky uh, that in Ireland we've had quite a, a relatively comprehensive and certainly a very broad um, grassland survey that took place called the Irish Semi-Natural Grassland Survey between 2007 and 2012. Uh, there have been surveys before and since, but this is the, the broadest one with the most study sites. Um, if you guys are interested, you can find it online. There's some links here and the guys are going to put them up in the chat and we can put them up again at the end of the talk. Um, you'll be able to find the report that goes with this. It's Irish Wildlife Manual number 78. If you look on the NPWS website, npws.ie, and if you go to publications and look for Irish Wildlife Manual number 78, you can read all about this survey. But you can do an even quicker thing. You can go and look at all the, the data online on this mapper. So I've shown an image there of the mapper. And I'll come back to that later. 
So you can see all the different uh, data that was collected visually on a map of Ireland. So this survey was commissioned by National Parks and Wildlife Service and carried out by Beck consultants. Almost 1,200 sites were visited. So that's all the green dots there on the, that you can see on the image. And at these sites, almost 4,500 quadrats were carried out. So that means that a surveyor marked out a two by two meter plot and they made a list of the plants, a detailed list of the plants within that. So that's what a quadrat is, two by two meters in this case, and a list of the plants. And as part of this work across all of these sites, 23,000 hectares of semi-natural grasslands were mapped. So it's a really, really good, broad uh, data set that we have. Detailed data analysis was carried out on all the information that came in, vast quantities, and four main grassland types have emerged. Now there are subtypes, there's, there's an infinite amount of detail we, we, you could go into, we won't, we'll look at the four main grassland types, too wet, too dry. So I'm gonna put up two graphs here that look very complicated. You don't need to worry too much, don't mind the details. I'm gonna talk you through the patterns because they help us understand the different grassland types. So here's the first graphic again, don't worry about the detail. Um, each one of the dots on this graph is one of those sample points, one of those quadrats. So each one of those is 4,500 dots on that. And the data analysis decided that there was four different grassland types. I'll talk about how it made those decisions. So the grassland types are called GL1, 2, 3, and 4, and they're color coded there. And the color coding will be on this slide and, and the next one. Again, don't need to worry too much uh, about that at the moment. Down here at the bottom, we have some of the main differences, the main things that were identified as helping uh, uh, separate out these different grassland types. So I'm gonna talk you through a couple of them. So down here on the bottom graph, on the left-hand side, we have fertility in soil P, which is soil phosphorus at the left-hand side. So that means if you're at the left-hand side of the graph, there's high fertility and high soil phosphorus. Let's go up to the upper graph, GL2 grasslands, they're on the left-hand side, so they're strongly associated with high fertility and high soil phosphorus. That's how, the, how this works. Let's look at the opposite side of the graph. So come back down to the bottom one, right-hand side, richness. That refers to species richness. So if you're on the right-hand side of the graph, you're associated, this type of grassland is associated with high species richness. So let's go up to the upper one, GL3 and GL4. These grassland types, the purple and the blue, they're associated with high species richness. We'll look at one more down at the bottom. So on the bottom graph, down at the very bottom, the word wetness. So if you're down at the bottom of the graph and kind of a little bit bottom left, uh, these are the wettest grasslands. So let's move up and look at the top one again, GL1. Those are the grasslands that are more towards the bottom of the graph and the bottom left corner. So the GL1 grasslands are our wettest grasslands. So this is the way the data analysis works. It looks at all of this in much greater detail than that, of course, and it pulls out the patterns. And so the main patterns that we're seeing across this huge data set, four and a half thousand releves or quadrats, so the main pattern, species richness was lowest on soils with high fertility. The next main pattern, the pH of the soil, so whether it was acid or alkaline, and conversely, the percent of organic matter. So you can imagine if there's high organic matter, it's probably a peat, it's probably quite acid. So the pH of the soil, or conversely, the percentage of organic matter, they were very important in helping to separate out grassland types. Wetness and dryness was also very important in separating out grassland types. And an interesting um, uh, finding, species richness was higher on grasslands on slopes. But I will urge caution here, steep slopes may be just where the semi-natural grasslands remain. So if you can imagine maybe an esker grassland or an acid grassland on a mountainside, it's very hard to get in with a plow and to, to reseed and, and plow a grassland like that. So very often um, grassland, species rich grasslands are found on slopes simply because they have not been agriculturally improved in those situations. So I'm going to talk you through the four grassland types and give you, try and give you, allow you to, to form a picture of those four grassland types. And there's a photograph of each one as well. So we'll start with GL2. So this is a species poor, damp or wet grassland on fertile soils on flat land. Think of your typical rushy field. That's what a GL2 is. And these often grade into maybe even a more improved or semi-improved category. So these often uh, will be quite species poor and they might have a lot of the agricultural species. Now I'm just gonna flick up on the top of the screen there, just a composite of the two graphs from the, the slide before. If that's too detailed, you can just ignore it. But if you're if you're looking at the, the trends, this, this is a reminder, you can see where they sit in relation to the drivers. So number two, and another picture has just flicked up here. These are wet grasslands as well, but they're often on peaty soils. This is GL1, that's the second type of grassland that I'm mentioning. The species richness here varies, it can be quite high and it varies with soil fertility. So the more, 
just in your mind's eye, think of a more species rich or a more low nutrient wet field. They'll often be, um, they'll be nicer species here. It might not be fantastically species rich, but there won't, it won't be dominated by your, your agricultural, your typical agricultural um, handful. Okay, GL3. These are species rich grasslands on calcareous soils, also nutrient poor soils, sometimes on slopes. So in your mind's eye for GL3, you can think of maybe a burn grassland or an esker grassland. Though of course, they won't all be as species rich or as special as those. And the final one, GL4. These are typically fairly species rich. They're on neutral to acid soils, typically nutrient poor as well, often on slopes. For GL4, think of your acid upland grassland. So hopefully that gives you a little, a little picture in your mind's eye um, of the different grassland types we have. So now onto where are these grasslands found? So in order to answer that question, I'm gonna look at a subset of our grassland types. Uh, we have these grasslands that we call Annex 1 grasslands because they're listed on the EU Habitats Directive. And because we've got international obligations to, to monitor these and report on them, we know in, in good detail, uh, not great, but good detail about where they are and how they're faring. So the information I'm gonna present uh, is based on those, but remember they're a subset of our, our broad categories. So the species rich calcareous grasslands, uh, what I want you to look at here, there's going to be four, four of these grasslands, so four maps. We're looking at the red hatching. So the area with the red hatching is where this occurs, and it's within the kind of green and blue envelope. So species-rich calcareous grasslands, not surprisingly, you know, centred around the central limestone plain in Ireland and a little bit up into to Sligo, um, where, where you have calcareous uplands. Species-rich nardus grassland, on the other hand, which is an acid upland grassland, is, is almost the opposite. It almost rings the limestone central plain of Ireland. So these are our upland, more acid mountains where this is found. Millennium meadows, which is a, a type of species-rich wet grassland. Again, very much a western and northern uh, distribution here. A, a, lot, a good few sites in the Midlands. And the final one, lowland hay meadows, which are extremely rare and would have been hugely common. Um, so again, just looking at where the red hatching is, you can see there are quite a few squares for lowland hay meadows, quite a lot, maybe in the West Connemara, the Burren, and up around the Shannon Callows. But I hope what you'll have seen from, from these, I'll flick back to the, the other slide and forward again. Um, there's a very strong trend towards these grasslands being largely uh, the midlands of Ireland, but towards the west and the northwest. Uh, very few in the, in the south and in the east, apart from maybe in the upland areas for some of the acid grasslands. So this is where the best of the best semi-natural grasslands are found. What about all the rest? Well, look, go explore. Uh, this, uh, the online mapper, all of these green dots hold information on semi-natural grasslands across Ireland. So I encourage you to, to go explore and both the annex grasslands, the really special ones, and the less special, just uh, every everyday semi-natural grasslands. They're all, the whole spectrum is covered here. If you do go look at the mapper, this is an example of what you can see in the level of detail. When you zoom in, the green dot disappears and habitat maps for the grasslands appear. So this is the Phoenix Park as an example. You can see on the left hand side you have a legend so you can see via the symbols and the colours what type of grassland you have. So I encourage you to go, go have a look and play with that. So tips for recognising a semi-natural grassland if you're exploring in the real world rather than a, on a virtual mapper. So if you walked into the field that's in that photograph there you might think oh god I, I don't know. I don't know whether this is a good a, a good grassland or not. And I, I wouldn't blame you at first glance. So what to look for? Look, it's kind of simple, really, uh, in, in one way. You want to see lots of different species. You don't need to know what they are. You don't need to be able to name them. But you want to see lots of different types of grass, lots of different types of flowering plant. Um, you, and, and it's as simple as that. You just need to be able to see differences. What you don't want is a, a field full of all the same plant, typically a grass. Um, you want to see lots of herbs, and I don't mean culinary herbs, I mean herbaceous, so we mean broadleafed herbs, so the flowers, basically. So you want a, a, a really good sign of a nice semi-natural grassland is a really good um, proportion of these flowering plants. So in a, a highly productive agricultural field, it'll be almost all grass, very few broadleafed herbs, very few flowers. So the more flowers you're seeing, the better the grassland. If you're lucky enough to be there on a, a warm summer's day, you should be, it should be humming. There should be lots of insect life. Uh, it's often very a very obvious feature, but it can be weather dependent, of course, and time of year dependent. And again, you won't see this necessarily, but there, there will be very healthy soils, with excellent fungal networks underground. Sometimes 
you might have uh, areas of moss. This is a close up, by the way, of the, that same grassland. And that is a fantastic grassland, by the way, um, when you look closely. And um, there might be moss, there might be rocks, there might be scrub and bushes and anthills. So if you see anthills, if you see rocks, it's a fairly good sign that that they're particularly the anthills, that the area hasn't been managed intensively. There hasn't been a plow in, there hasn't been fertilizer. So anytime you see anthills, it's a, it's a fantastic sign really in a grassland. So they're often lumpy and bumpy and a bit scraggy looking, messy looking at certain times of the year in particular. Um, other things to look out for, if you see orchids or sedges, sedges are quite like grasses at first glance, but they're, they're a different group of plants. If you see orchids or sedges, you're, you're probably in an area that's managed relatively extensively. Intensive management, agricultural management tends to knock out these species. They don't compete well against uh, the more competitive grasses, for example, when the, the management intensity is ramped up. So those are some of the tips. Okay, let's ask the question, are semi-natural grasslands under threat? So I mentioned already our kind of broad uh, survey, the Irish Semi-Natural Grassland Survey that ran 2007 to 2012. Well, there was another survey carried out 2015 to 2017 and a subset, a much smaller subset of the sites were revisited. Uh, and these were only the annex grasslands, so really the best of the best across three types of annex grassland. Uh, you can also find the, the report for this survey online. It's Irish Wildlife Manual number 102 on the NPWS webpage, the, the publication section. Um, so when surveyors went back, there was on average six years between the two surveys from when the revisit happened to, to, to the first visit, only in only six years. So for the annex quality calcareous grasslands, 31% of the area was gone. It was no longer an annex calcareous grassland. Millennium meadows, so the, this kind of wet grassland, species which wet grassland, 7% were gone in that six year period. And for hay meadows, 28% were gone. So these are quite shocking figures for losing this proportion of the best of the best grasslands. And to be honest, these figures could be underestimates because these were the best of the best. The losses in the wider countryside could be larger. So what are the threats to semi-natural grasslands? What are the main things that are driving these losses? So the most devastating loss is habitat loss. So conversion to intensive agriculture. So if the ground is fertilized, reseeded, drained. Conversion to forestry is fast catching up, particularly for wet grasslands as being one of the main drivers of habitat loss. So planting trees is only useful if it's the right tree in the right place. Planting Sitka spruce on a species rich grassland is a disaster. But the other main threat, which may be surprising, is abandonment, so lack of management. So this is less drastic and less immediate, but it applies to absolutely huge areas. It absolutely dwarfs the impact of habitat loss when you, when you look at area. So look, the key message is semi-natural grasslands need management, but it needs to be appropriate. So it needs to be on the extensive end rather than the intensive end of the spectrum. Okay, and related to that, just a, a note on nutrients and fertilizers in terms of threats to semi-natural grasslands. So apart from reseeding, it's the most damaging activity that can happen. A semi-natural grassland is valuable because of the variety of plant species that are within it and all the animals they support and all the services that they combine to, to provide. And if you add nutrients, you drastically alter the species composition. You give a huge competitive advantage. You hand it on a plate to the grasses and a handful of grasses at that. And they then squeeze out most of the other plant species. So it's very simple what happens. Uh, but it, 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 it might not be obvious and, and it might not be visible. Again, is this one of these things that is just not visible? If somebody, to go back to the woodland analogy, if somebody fells a woodland, this public outcry, if somebody fertilizes a semi-natural grassland, does anybody notice? Um, and just to, 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 as a reminder of the effects of fertility and adding nutrients and diversity, remember, four and a half thousand samples from the Irish Semi-Natural Grassland Survey, and you'll remember this graphic, and fertility in soil phosphorus at one end of the spectrum, the blue arrows are pointing, and at the other end, species richness. So there is no question about the, uh, the relationship between high fertility and the addition of nutrients to the species richness. And this, the three images below, they're not actually from the same grassland. I couldn't easily lay my hands on one, but they, they could be. So on the left-hand side, you've got a species rich grassland. In the middle, there's an example of grassland that was very like that. It was a species rich hay meadow. And uh, when the surveyors went back six years later, the farmer had applied slurry and it had changed to look like this. So it had become grass dominated and the flowering plants were squeezed out. If the farmer went another step and reseeded, 
rather than just fertilizing, it might end up looking like the one on the right. So this is the type of thing, uh, the type of effect that can be had. Okay, so coming close to the end, and I'm afraid I have some bad news. Um, I had said that I might talk about callows and floodplain grasslands if time allowed. These are absolutely fascinating and they're hugely important. And Ireland has a huge, huge, uh, vast uh, resource and abundance of these grasslands, each with, with, with challenges as well. They deserve a talk of their own, to be honest. Um, I have commissioned a large nationwide survey. It's a two year survey and it's concluding later this year. And I propose to talk more about that, about these grasslands then. There simply isn't time to do them justice. And what I am going to do is I'm going to talk about something else which has is very pertinent, it's very important, and it's very current. There's been a lot of discussion, particularly on social media over the last few weeks. I'm going to talk a little bit about, and in inverted commas, wildflower meadows and wildflower seed mixes, because I think this is hugely important. I was very, very saddened and shocked to see I did this just uh, two days ago. I typed the word wildflower meadows into Google, and these are the first um, top 15 or 16 results that come back. This is so surprising and disappointing. Only two of these images are actual wildflower meadows, and I'd actually even have my doubts about the one on the right. But all the others, without question, are not made up of uh, native wildflowers, and they're not meadows. And we have, we have a problem here. We have a problem in terms of people's understandings and expectations. Um, so the bigger photo here shows an example of what a meadow looks like. So a meadow is a grassy area and a wildflower meadow will have a mix of grasses and wild flowering plant species in it. So in this photograph, we have ragwort, we have um, red clover, that's probably a bit of yellow rattle. We've got a mix of grasses, it's fairly grassy. We've got sneezewort, which is a lovely uh, plant of kind of wet meadows. Um, and this isn't a, a wildflower meadow. Now, you could say am I being a bit pedantic, but there, there, there is a reason for us to be concerned about this. And there, there is a reason to, to think about what, how we're naming things and how we're approaching these. Horticultural planting, which is what's shown in the smaller picture, that really should be limited to gardens and to urban spaces, where it has a place without doubt. Non-local, non-native seed from planting such as this can end up contaminating and irreversibly damaging our precious semi-natural grasslands. So we really need to recalibrate um, and we need a collective effort on that. And we need to learn to love our native wildflowers, AKA our weeds. So this image is, is, is very pretty. And I think a lot of people would really enjoy this. All we've got here is red clover, white clover, buttercup and dock. These are all very common species. Most people would call them weeds, but this is very pleasing. Now, wildflower meadows don't always look pleasing, but these are the species that our native invertebrates, our native birds, our native mammals are adapted to work with, to feed from, to shelter within. So we need to manage expectations. Real wildflower meadows can be messy. They can look weedy. They can be more grassy than flowery. This is very grassy, but this, this is, this this is what uh, what a um, a typical meadow might look like. So you've got species of grass. You've also got species of flower in here, and all of these are native, and all of these are utilizable by our native species. So we do need to, a, a little bit of recalibration and management of expectations, and. But you might say, God, well, are you saying that, that, that planting a beautiful, colourful, joyful mix like this, is it ever appropriate? Well, look, in urban settings for a quick splash of colour and in garden and horticultural settings, yeah, maybe. But what we're at risk, and certainly by calling them wildflower meadows or wildflower seeds, we're at risk uh, of, of some people misunderstanding. These are no substitute for natural regeneration of native plants. Native plants are what our native animals feed on. And there are also no substitution for it for situations where we might want to restore via seed that's sourced locally. So, for example, this photograph here shows somebody who uh, on the Aran Islands who's uh, doing trials on collecting seed from wildflowers there. So you might have collected seed through various mechanisms. People might use green hay, which is where you cut hay and maybe a farmer would then bring the hay same day to a neighboring field, which might be less species rich. You shake out the hay, the seeds fall. Again, it's all about keeping it local. Plug plants, where somebody might grow some plants, native species, local, from seed, and it might be seeded in. So these are methods that are suitable for restoration. National re natural regeneration is the, the, the priority and the, the best. Uh, some restoration may be useful, but actually planting in what's sold as wildflower mixes is, is rarely a good idea. If you're in an urban setting, if you want this for your garden, if you want the quick splash of colour, Maybe it's okay, but I would ask you to consider, is it worth it? 
There's a lot of damage done in terms of perception of what a wildflower meadow is with the general public. People now expect this flower bed type show rather than a grassy actual wildflower meadow. You also have the risk of species contaminating existing semi-natural grasslands. I'm going to give you an example. As over the last few years I've been driving around the country, I've noticed along a lot of our roadsides beautiful shows of cowslips. And I noticed some of them were very big. Uh, and then I started to notice, God, lots of them are very big. And I realized that actually along certain of our roads, our big roads, our motorways, some of the companies, they must have gone and sourced what they thought presumably was wildflower seed, from, but they must have sourced it from abroad. And what they've brought in is a cowslip that's bred to be large and showy. So this is not native. It's not going to have been bred and grown in Ireland. Um, and it's definitely not the Irish species. It's definitely not the Irish um, variant. So it's not going to... And this variant, which is now bigger and showier and comes from somewhere else, this might interbreed with our native cowslips, which I can tell you are not doing well. So this is one of the risks, contamination of existing populations. Look, also worth considering is the cost of replanting these showy areas every year compared to a self-sustaining semi-natural grassland habitat. So all things to consider. Um, I'm going to wrap that up now in terms of the wildflower meadows and wildflower mixes, and I'm going to give you some key take home messages. So back to the big picture back to the semi-natural grasslands across the whole country, the key take home messages. Um, we have amazing semi-natural grasslands in the country, wet and dry, acid and calcareous, grazed and mown, huge variety, each with their own characteristic suite of species, all of which are adapted to be just there. And all of which support a wide range of critters, big and small, and they're all reliant on these habitats, but they are in great peril. Sometimes we simply don't see them. We have this background matrix of green, of fields. We sometimes just don't see that there's a difference between them. Or if we do, we don't recognize their value. Sometimes the value is recognized, but the value of other land uses is perceived as being more important. So the value of intensive agricultural production can be valued against maybe the biodiversity, the flood attenuation, the various other um, ecosystem services that a grassland might give us. Sometimes the value from planting to forestry may appear to be larger than retaining a species rich grassland. What are the solutions? Definitely awareness, education and discussion. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I give talks like this, try to wear, raise awareness of the, the, the semi-natural grasslands we have, why they're important, how we can tell, how we, how we can recognize them and to start people thinking and talking and making informed decisions. We need to value nature and all the services it provides. Not every patch of land can give us or should give us um, highly productive uh, agriculture. Maybe it could give us moderate or low productive ag agriculture with lots of other benefits too. So we need to start valuing nature and factoring that in. We also need to support farmers. We can't just expect people to, to, to change or to even take a hit on their livelihoods. So, uh, for example, uh, via results-based in uh, agri-environment schemes. And Ireland is actually a world leader in this field. And it's one of the great areas of hope that we can mainstream this, that we can um, expand on a lot of the existing projects. Um, and, and we are in a good place to do that. But even in intensive agriculture, even in intensive farming, we must find a, a way to make or to retain some space for nature. Sterile landscapes are, are just... It's a wasted opportunity because we can have space for nature um, even in very intensive agriculture. And that's that's been shown with, with little or no loss of productivity. So we need to start a focus on that as well. The main thing that I'd like you to take home, spread the word, tell people grasslands are great. OK, final slide. Uh, if anybody would like to get in touch, maria.long at housing.gov.ie. So my email address has changed recently. And I'm on Twitter at grasslands IRL. The last thing I'm going to put up then is a list of resources. I don't expect you to look at all of this now, of course, but you'll be able to look at this um, on the recording that goes up and you'll be able to, to um, maybe take down some of the detail if you want to read any more. In particular, the top two things there, the top page is I have a grasslands page on the NPWS website. So if you Google NPWS grasslands and it links to some of the main surveys and the mapper and a few things like that. Also, the BSBI, Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland, they have a project uh, that they're running, I'm uh, involved uh, and, and part funded, the Irish Grasslands Project. And there are absolutely excellent training videos on grass identification and telling different types of grasslands apart. Really good training videos. So if you want to know more, uh, and certainly the nitty gritty, I would advise you to, to, to Google the BSBI 
Irish Grasslands project. And okay, that, that is it from me. Thank you so much. All right, Maria, you're on the screen now. Can you see us or can you yes. see me? Perfect. Yes, and um, I can see myself for the first time today. Well, there you go. That was an excellent talk, Maria. An excellent overview on what the semi-natural grasslands are. And then a nice food for thought as well on, on the wildflower meadows. And I'm, I, I'm sure we could talk more about that. Have you time for a few questions? Yes, I do. Great stuff. Um, I suppose I was thinking there myself, there, there's a couple of questions to the audience, but um, they're kind of doubly invisible in a way, these semi-natural grasslands, because, again, they're not habitats you can see from a distance. They're not habitats you can kind of walk through as easily as you might do in a woodland. There, are very, there aren't that many public sites which are species-rich semi-natural grasslands. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a hard site to kind of um, develop in that way. I mean, there, I know there are some, I don't want to be sending everyone now to uh, the grasslands, because, of course, they're probably quite fragile habitats, are they, for visitors as well? Um, yes and no. Do you know what? Grasslands thrive on management, and often that management is uh, cattle Trampling. and horses. So yep. Actually, listen, and, and do you know what? There's a reason that our rugby pitches, our hurling pitches are made from grass. Grass is resistant to a lot of trampling, so not as much as you might think. Okay. Um, so, but it does depend. Humans are funny. We're not like cattle. We won't roam randomly across a field. We'll tend to follow a path. Yeah. So yeah, yeah we can often, you know. But uh, you know what? They're they're not they're not as fragile as you might think. Hmm. Yeah, and there are ones which can be visited, and which I, you know, there are ones in national parks and so on. And when you can get further around the country as the summer goes on, hopefully you can get to see them and see them in, in all their glory because they're amazing. Um, I think we might go to a couple of the audience questions in a minute because there's, there's a few in there. I know, I know we're short for time. Um, lots of great comments there. In the People have really enjoyed the chat. I don't I know. You can't see that yourself. Yeah, there's yeah. an awful lot of comments. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're seeing them come up there. Excellent. Yeah. Um, let's see now. Just a, a, so if we have, we've got great coverage now of where the semi-natural grasslands are, but are we, are we still looking for more? Yes. Un unequivocally yeah. yes so we visited a lot so we we can we can um you know you know we the the main survey visited over a thousand sites so but there are a lot more grasslands than that that gives us a broad picture so we broadly know where different types are and we broadly know what's impacting them but undoubtedly there are loads and loads of grasslands that haven't been visited yet so yes i would love to know if people know of nice grasslands for sure and the thing is, like I said, with woodlands, we, 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 know, we know where our nice coastal sand dunes are and we know where most of our good woodlands are. They're just very much more obvious. They're predictable yes, they where they are. Everybody gets it. Grasslands, not so much for, for some a, of the reasons I mentioned. And of course, yeah. they can change in a small enough window of time. You know, 10 years sure. time, what was a species of grassland might, might have been abandoned to a situation where you no longer spot it. So I suppose it's even more important that we find them while they're here and we can manage them, manage them appropriately. Um, I'll go to some of the audience questions now because I know I'm just looking at some of how they were voted. Um, so there's a question there about this, actually. What options are available to support farmers who wish to maintain or improve the quality of their grassland? Um, it, a large amount depends on where they are. Um, you have the option, of course, to, to join GLOSS or whatever it's called now, our kind of national agri-environment scheme. It tends to be a... look. It's, it's okay, but it tends to be a little bit of a low bar. You might want to go even higher. So in certain parts of the country, particularly if you're near the Burren, if you're in certain parts of the west of Ireland, there are um, various, they're called EIPs, uh, yeah. European Innovation Projects. And there's a number, there's 23, I think, maybe more. But they're, they're quite targeted, aren't they? They are, but some of them are very, very large. So for example, the Pearl Mussel Project and the Hen Harrier Project, both of those cover vast, vast areas of land. Now you still need to be within their catchment, but they tend to support uh, very broad, common sense, nature-friendly farming management with the broad aim of making the habitats better for target species. So one is the Hen Harrier, one is the Pearl Mussel, but neither of those, both of those plans um, support sensible nature friendly farming on a broad landscape scale so while the the target the species might sound very targeted the, the type of farming they support and the type of farming that they're that they're uh, teaching farmers about and helping support them to do is very broad so th there's going to be huge very broad landscape benefits to this type of thing um farming for nature is a fantastic resource for farmers that want to know more and want to link up so if anybody googles farming for nature it's an organization that gives a voice to farmers that are already farming with nature in mind they're farming on the more extensive side they have lots of different leaflets you can download and you can ask questions they have forums so i would say go to farming for nature and and start feeling your way around what, what they have and asking some questions there great um, the, the, the speaking of the AIPs and the kind of large areas they sometimes treat for, I suppose you're getting, when we talk, we've talked about, I know we talked about, to talk about rewilding there a couple of weeks back. And when we say rewilding, it doesn't mean necessarily abandonment. They don't have to be in the same thing. So 
this is, I suppose, an area where the likes of species which grasslands could, could fall down on. You don't want a situation where you're abandoning them. So how does that fit into the whole rewilding concept? Yeah, I think the rewilding concept is tricky again. Language, like like what yeah. do you call a wildflower meadow? Rewilding means different things in different yeah. people's heads, and for some people, it means humans walk away. And I don't think that's a great idea usually because humans have made too much of a mess across most of our land. So basically, to me and to many people, rewilding should be about relaxing the management and making the management more nature friendly and less intensive. So typically you're stepping back from chemical use, from reseeding, you're maybe changing your grazing regime and lessening it. So rewilding is about making way more space for nature, but it's not about walking away. Um, there might be scenarios and there might be landscapes and there might be areas where that's appropriate, but across an awful lot of our landscape, that isn't appropriate because we've already modified it so much. Um, and also if we were to, for whatever reason in the morning, suddenly stop managing all our grasslands in Ireland, all of them, for whatever reason, we would lose a huge amount of our, the biodiversity that has over decades and centuries evolved to be here. So there's a huge, there, there is a place for management and it's about the, the intensity of that. And there's a place for yeah. very, very low management. Uh, and the word rewilding, there are many people that are still farming with cattle that are calling themselves rewilding. And that's that's totally fine. But it, it, it's, it's, a, it's just a troublesome phrase because it can mean different, people can mean different things. Yeah, so there's a spectrum there. I think we have to acknowledge the gray areas that they are there and that, that it is a spectrum. I think there's a lot of black and white thinking in a lot of a lot of areas of the world at the moment. So we need to kind of be aware that it's a slightly ambiguous phrase yeah. and not apply it to every uh, project, maybe. Um, just be clear about what, what, what's meant or, you know, if you're asking a question or if you're proposing a project or whatever, it just need to be, be clear because it, it is a word that can mean many things. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the links in a bit to a question there about, um, you know, what, what management is needed to keep these intact. I think you've kind of touched on a bit of it already, though. Um, yeah, they need to be grazed or mown. Um, depending on the inherent fertility of the soil, you might just need one mow a year if it's very low fertility, or you might need two mows a year and an aftergraze in a, a mown situation. If it's grazing, you need a certain level uh, of grazing. So you want to keep the habitat open. Um, I have a great, uh, I have a very broad tolerance for patches of scrub and briars in a field because that brings a great element of habitat diversity. So it doesn't yeah. need to be all very uniform. And in fact, it's better if it's not. But yeah, you need grazing or mowing uh, and it needs to be yearly. Uh, even yeah. a year or two can change the, di the, the dynamic quite strongly. Yeah. It'll change the dynamic of, you know, parasitic species and so on, um, of, of fl flowering plants, is it? Or... Yeah, yeah. Or you can have a build up if, if the site is inherently quite productive, um, you can have a build up of litter and that litter yeah. then, um, that, that, that dead plant material that cloaks the ground, that can inhibit germination the following year. So, you know, sometimes it might take a few years to have such an effect, but in some sites it might happen quite quickly. And so you then lose species. Yeah. Yeah, and you're you're relying then on what might uh, be quite long lived in a seed bank after that if you are trying to instigate restoration. So yeah, you want regular light touch management. That's yeah, that's the ideal, Excellent. I guess. Mm. Now this question was kind of answered in the talk itself, but on a heavy fertile soil, um, will it will a heavy fertile soil support a wide diverse collection of plant species, or will fertility tends to reduce the biodiversity of the site? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. The more fertile your soil, uh, the less diverse your flower meadow might be, if if that's what you're you're aiming for. For uh, you know, I, I, you know, depends on the scenario. But yeah, you you might want to significantly manage your expectations. There might be there might be just fewer, but you're going to be able to get clovers and plantains and dandelions and all of these things are so hugely valuable. But often. They're valuable to nature. We often don't value them because they're commonplace and we see them as weeds, of course. And a weed is just, just a plant that a human doesn't want for whatever reason. One person's weed is another person's jewel. So look, the more fertile your soil, the more the grasses are gonna retain their vigor. They're gonna be quite vigorous and, the, and they're gonna slog it out with the other species and maybe squeeze them out. So you've got a harder challenge. You just might want to have slightly different expectations on that site. Um, some people say don't even bother trying. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. It depends what the aim of the game is. You can you can make any site better for nature. You can make any site a bit more flower rich, but you might not get a, a show meadow on a very rich site. Um, in the UK, where they tend to, they're further down the road in this way, and they tend to have both the money and the means to take more drastic measures. Sometimes they will strip the top soil from sites in order to remove the fertility. It's quite a drastic measure. Yeah. I'm I'm more sit on the, the the side. Just manage your expectations uh, for 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 different areas. But that that is an option, and that has been done. 
question, I suppose, slightly along the same spectrum. Uh, would you know of what grasses might be suitable to plant in a, in a shaded kind of area? What grasses species would, would go well in a sheltered or shaded area? Okay, so this is kind of a horticultural question. So I won't know necessarily horticultural varieties, but definitely there are grasses that are found in woodlands and woodland edges and along hedgerow banks. So in the wild situation, there are things like Brachypodium, Melica, a few other things that cope well in shady environments. And I have also seen them or their relatives grown in gardens. So what you want to do is a bit like you might choose ferns in your garden for a shady situation. You want to choose the grass species that are more closely associated with woody habitats. So um, you could make a start by looking up Melica or Brachypodium and see, well, what do they have in, you know, in the garden centers or in, in horticulture in those. Now, I'm sure there could be a raft of other horticultural plants that, that somebody who's trained in horticulture might be able to say, but they're the ones that exist, uh, some of the ones that come to mind anyway, that exist in the- Sure, in, the, in the nature, in the wild Ireland, yeah. yeah. Now, a question about chalk is, is ch a question, but it's quite a, a specific technical question. Is chalk grassland high in species diversity because it be, can be po populated by obligate and facultative calcicoles and therefore physiology, physiology plays an important role here rather than soil fertility so is it to do with the the calcium in the soil rather than um the, the was it to do with the plant physiology rather than the soil calcium are there much studies on this um there's a lot of there's a lot of work done on um, calcareous grasslands. We don't technically have chalk grasslands because we don't have much chalk geology. But we do have limestone grasslands or calcareous grasslands. They're very similar. They have a lot of chalk grasslands in the UK because they have some more chalk geology. Um, it comes down to nutrients um, still because if there was plenty of nutrients in the soil, regardless of the amount of calcium, you'd have these big brutes that, that thrive on high nutrient levels and that are really good at hoovering up nutrients and spreading out their roots and underground, spreading out their tillers above ground. You will have these competitive grasses still squeezing out the, the diversity of smaller flowering plants. So it still comes down to nutrients. But if you take the nutrients out of the picture and if you have lots of space then for a variety of plants to come in, if you have a limestone grassland, you're going to get species that are adapted to coping with high calcium. So um, what, if, you, if you have low nutrient soils, whether it's acid or calcareous, that then does influence the, the suite of species that can make it their home if they're not being squeezed out by the competitive grasses, if that makes sense. Grant? Just looking at the next question, as I was, because in relation to things being squeezed out, are there issues with certain invasive plants in the grasslands? So again, there's another thing that might be encroaching upon grasslands. Plants such as Japanese wood knotweed, do they take a hold in semi-natural grasslands in Ireland as such? Um, not massively. Yeah, it, it's an interesting one, the Japanese knotweed. No, it's, it's very much more a plant of uh, banks and edges and urban environments. In one way, if because grasslands are managed, even if it's low intensity, if they're mown or grazed, Taller plants like that don't really get to take hold. Now, if you did have a standard Japanese knotweed and someone went in with a mower, you could end up spreading the thing very far. Yeah, but no, it isn't yeah. a feature of, of grasslands. And um, we do have some species that are native that can be a bit problematic and spread in the grasslands like bracken. That's another thing. If you have a year or two uh, where the grass, a grassland isn't managed for a certain reason and there's bracken in the area, the bracken can come in and change the grassland significantly because the bracken brings an element of shade. And you get a loss of certain species that need the open habitat. So it's not really the, the question you asked me, but there can be species that spread and cause cause changes in the in the habitat and in the species makeup. Um, we are likely to see, I'll be surprised if we don't see some examples of species jumping from these kind of wildflower seed packets that are really well intentioned. Um, but if they're close relatives of some of our grassland plants, we're going to start seeing them more in grasslands. Um, it's not yet a big issue, but their planting has gone from from zero to 100 uh, overnight. You know, in a couple of years ago, people were not planting wildflower seed mixes and now they're being planted everywhere, uh, absolutely everywhere up and down the country. So that could be something to watch for the future, especially for the like I gave the example of the cowslips where we've closely related species, but where the seed that's being planted is either a cultivar that's bred to be strong and big or whether it's just simply from further away. It may have different competitive advantages. It isn't evolved to fit naturally within the, the the communities we have here in our grasslands. I'm going to get back to the wildflowers in a minute for I think to, to wrap up. But just there's a question, or, there's two questions here which I'm going to combine because it was a, someone was asking a question about parkland conversion, but it wasn't expanded upon. But then there's a question about 
It's actually related to the OPW, though, as opposed to National Parks and Wildlife Service. It's the Phoenix Park and grassland management. They're just um, wondering, um, is there a possibility of improving grassland in the Phoenix Park? Because um, there are hay, the, the, the grass is cut there, but um, is, the hay, is, is the hay removed or is the hay actually left in place? Mm. And the herbivores then in the park, are they, are they grazing enough? I don't know much about the management regime in sure. the Phoenix Park, a, but I do walk in the Phoenix Park and I look at it with a grassland ecologist eyes and I do wish for more for it. Yeah. Definitely in terms of its uh, ecology and biodiversity potential. There's a, a lot of it is very uniform and a lot of it is very grass dominated. So I definitely think that some subtle changes in management could be implemented across parts of the park that might result in, um, in increased uh cover of you know the the flowering herbs and stuff yeah it's so look i don't know much about the detail and it's something that definitely could be looked at and it's uh, a very it's a very interesting area because the, it's, such the, it's such a large area of public grassland there could be a lot of um experiments done to find out what would be the best the best fit there yeah and there's lots of space there's lots of space exactly. to, to play around with different yeah, you know if parts I mean. were left longer you know that humans would just walk around it. It, it you know there's 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 plenty of space to, to to play around with stuff yeah. yeah you can still have concerts and all the rest of it there and, and deer and everything yeah. um and yeah. we have concerts again now a question about species isn't is isn't uh, an invasive species but it often is um not regarded very well by people ragwort how does that fit into our same natural grasslands yeah poor old ragwort huh so ragwort is um it's a native species. It fits in just fine uh, most of the time. If uh, if everything else is in balance, and if you've got um, if you don't have a yeah if you don't have a very altered situation, the ragwort won't tend to dominate. You rarely see a semi-natural grassland where it's full of ragwort heads. You'll just see the odd plants scattered around. Great for pollinators. Ragwort tends to become a weed when things are out of balance. When you've got the small handful of species that can do well in a high nutrient intensive management situation. Ragwort often does well there. So look, ragwort in and of itself uh, as a scattered plant in a semi-natural grassland, zero problem, apart from obviously it lists, it's listed as a noxious weed. So that's, that's, yeah. that's a legal issue. But in terms of the ecology, sits very nicely and is rarely, uh, is rarely a big problem and rarely comes to dominate uh, if you're in a fairly low fertility semi-natural grassland setting. Um, but obviously it does need to be managed um, if you're, you know, if you're moving, if you're trying to move from a more um, intensive grassland to maybe lighter management, you may go through a phase of a lot of ragwort. You may need to go, well, you should be probably pulling it if you have a lot anyway. But, you know, if you're moving from a very a high intensity uh, situation to low intensity management, you may get phases where certain of these species will kind of cycle through a, a little bit of dominance and you may need to, to intervene and pull them. It's an easy plant to pull, so it's not the that's that's true. Labor intensive, but it's not not the worst. You know, it has well, very well short. the the bucalons, as they call them. There you um, go. Yeah. And um, just to, just to clarify in the law, they're they're not they're classed as a noxious weed. Is it that needs to be removed? Well, I don't remember the the wording now, so maybe don't yeah. quote me on that. But sure. I think everybody is obliged to control it if it's on their land. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, so, the question was asked about the law there in relation to that, but it is yeah. this information is available as well. It is, it is, it is. And it is definitely, you're supposed to control it if it's on your land, because if it's dried and gets into hay, it can be poisonous. So when it's alive, animals, uh, the, the grazers just ignore it. So it's they really avoid it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah but if it's dried into hay, they're less able to avoid it. Yeah, so that's sure, where they, they can't tell. Yeah. yeah. The, back to the wildflowers. If you want to grow wildflowers that are native from an Irish supplier that is guaranteed to have native seeds, is this okay? Yes. The trouble is we have very few. There's only a couple of companies. And uh, so if you're buying from them, brilliant. And if you know that, brilliant. Ideally, if they're based in, for example, Donegal, they're not as it happens, but let's say there was a wildflower supplier in Donegal and you're in West Cork, hmm, possibly best. To, it's still better to try to stay somewhat regional in terms of planting into any sort of a natural situation. Um, and even with those, I don't know if the person in the question specified about whether it was going to be planting into gardens or planting in the wider countryside. It didn't specify, I think, mm. no, but um, there, that there's is a big that, difference. There is a big yeah, difference. You yeah, you really want to be very slow and want to be doing it under good advice if you're planting into the wide, wider countryside. Um, the best is to work with what's there and be slow and steady and accept what's there and come to value what's there and to work within that scenario. That is the, the absolute best. Failing that, um, yes, you want to be looking at locally, regionally sourced seed, definitely Irish sourced. And we just we just don't simply have have that many suppliers and definitely not enough suppliers to me. Like you can go into any shop now, any decent sized shop and pick up wildflower seed. And 
be thinking that you're doing a good thing for nature. And most of that is not Irish sourced. Most of that is not native, even if the species are native, if it says buttercup and clover. And often they'll be bred somewhere else or they'll be grown somewhere else or the seed will be from somewhere else. But there will be, a, you know, seed of a native species, but not sourced locally. So you couldn't be careful enough at reading the packaging. Uh, and there, But there are a handful of suppliers and that's where you should go if you are going down this route. And if you don't want to go down that route, it's like patience and acceptance and being a lazy gardener is only the best thing you can do at all. It's amazing what will come up in an area, even just by removing some of the bigger, tougher grasses, allowing things to come up. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to see what will come up. And it's amazing when you get your eye in. That's what I was kind of didn't really finish this area on. I was saying about them being doubly invisible. Not only are they kind of, you know, we don't tend to think of these landscapes when we go past them in our cars or whatever, but then. They're starting to be obscured now by these shows of, of flower beds and these you know amazing riots of colour, which is not a habitat in any sense. It's a football match or a festival or a fast food station for, for bees and so on. It isn't a neighbourhood. It isn't a habitat really where things will actually thrive and survive. It's just really a kind of a, a, a fast stop for they might get a bit of food out of. And it pleases our eye. Um, but is it actually you know doing much else? Yeah, I would just ask people to consider, uh, to pose the questions that I posed there. It's... There's a time and a place for everything. And I think, uh, you know, with the best will in the world, the, the, the this wildflower seed thing has gotten a little out of hand. So just question, do you need it? It's where you're putting it appropriate and are you buying the right type of seed? So, yeah. Well, there's certainly plenty of food for thought in this. And I hope that people will, you know, look at the, the maps and see where there might be some nice uh, species, rich grasslands near them and have a look for them and have a look at them. And there are places like in, in national parks and so on where you can see some of these in the summer yeah. and they're incredible. Um, some of them um, have amazing rare species in springtime. Some of them will be at their, their height in the summer and they're, they're incredible to look at. Um, that's, that's it for today's talks. Uh, thanks very much, Maria, for, for joining us today. That was uh, really um, incredible. I'll just um, remind uh, our audience that we also have our Rhododendron Week is on, is on this week down at Kilmacar Botanic Gardens, our sister garden in County Wicklow. And we have a talk um, this evening, tomorrow evening and Friday evening at uh, six o'clock each evening. Our director, Matthew Jebb, will be talking this evening. Tomorrow it's Richard Baines from Logan in Scotland will be giving a talk and Seamus O'Brien, our head gardener in Kilmacurra Botanic Gardens, will be giving a talk on Friday evening. Register there. And next week we have another in our spring series of talks here uh, with Lee Davies uh, from Kew Gardens talking about fungi. So we briefly touched on today that uh, the diversity of fungi under the soil. Next week we'll be talking about uh, your cousin is a mushroom. They're more important than you think. So uh, thanks very much, people, for listening. Thanks very much, Maria. Uh, we'll talk to you all again soon. All the best. Thank you, Ardens.